Uh, most of the budget is, the, the legislature simply has to pass it. You know, one third, one, one quarter of the budget is simply interest on the federal debt. Uh, you can't not pay the, the debt. You can't, you can't pay the bank, bankers. Another uh, third of it is uh, a mandated fund, funds for uh, Social Security, uh, welfare programs, things like that, that have been locked in, and so you can't get out of those either. Uh, another huge third of it is uh, the military. And the military, in a sense, is discretionary, but you've got all these contracts, long-term contracts for bombers and, and missiles, and then you've got all the people whose salary you've got to pay, and of course we don't want to extract the soldiers from uh, Iraq. Uh, so that's not, re even though in principle it's discretionary, it's not really discretionary. Uh, well, then that leaves, uh, you know, uh, just a small piece of change, and that's what's fought over in Congress every year. Um, right now, the United States Congress is fighting. It's got a budget resolution, but it has uh, only, con only small continuing resolutions for all the departments. It's supposed to get a uh, budget passed by October the 1st. This will not happen. Uh, it hasn't happened in, in the last four years. Um, but there's lots of debate about how to spend this very small piece of, ch of change. And a big section of it, the, the biggest single section, has to do with science and technology. Um, and I, just before here, I was at a, the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, which always uh, is, is it, the, the first speaker is the science, science advisor to the president. This, it, right now it's John Marburger, uh, the former director of Brookhaven National Laboratory, which is a laboratory like the one that was just being opened in 2003 in Canada. Um, and, and I'm convinced that, that the investments that we make in science and technology are, in many instances, really welfare for science. Uh, as a friend of mine called it, science doesn't want to admit that it's a, just another public interest group. Uh, it tries to rationalize what it's doing is saying, well, what we're doing is really disinterested, and we're trying to produce good for the society as a whole, and please give us more money now. But they're really just welfare queens in white coats. Uh, and uh, But how do you go into the middle of a community of scientists and try to gently suggest this in ways that you won't be read out of town on a rail, right? Uh, so that was my that was my struggle going to Canada in 2003. Um, now, the, the, the title of my talk is Science, Democracy, and Philosophy from Marginal Achievements to Impossible Opportunities. And what I did in this talk is to, to argue that philosophy in the modern period has tried to have an influence on science and its place in society in three different ways. Um, one is serving as a handmade for science. Two is serving as a handmade for democracy. And three is serving as a handmade for facilitating the relation between science and democracy. And so my, uh, what I did is try to, to, to map out uh, what's been going on in philosophical discussions in these three areas and try to acknowledge that there were some good things going on, uh, but then that was the, the marginal achievements. And then the second half of the talk tried to raise some impossible opportunities for philosophy. Could philosophy do anything more? Um, and that's where, uh, as you'll see at the end of this, I try to mention Buddhism. Um, so I'm, not, I'm going to talk some of this, I'm going to read some of it, uh, I'm going to skip over some of it uh, and try to keep my talk to uh, not more than another uh, 30 minutes or so, so that uh, Wolfgang and I can have a good discussion afterwards, okay? Uh, all right, the, the handmade to science part. Um, philosophy, at least in the Anglo-speaking, the Anglo-American world, has in many instances, probably in the majority instances, become philosophy of science. Uh, epistemology has become the philosophy of science. Uh, science is, is taken as the, the most valid form of knowledge, 
And philosophy's role is to help science make sure it's practicing its own method clearly, that it understands what its own methods are, so that it can continue to crank out true propositions uh, uh, over and over. Um, I review some of the discussions in the uh, uh, philosophy of science and how... Uh, where's my... Uh, I have a... I thought I came out with a uh, water. Is there any water around here? Oh, sorry. I wasn't okay. supposed to do that. I, I, oh, well, I thought I was supposed to, I thought I brought a bottle, but I apparently didn't. Um, so uh, I, I'm not going to say anything about that. It's kind of, kind of boring stuff. Uh, I'm just going to skip over that. Um, the... Uh, but it was necessary in the in the context in which I originally wrote this paper to uh, to say something. Some of it? What's that? Can you tell some of what you were going to skip. I'm sorry. A little bit of what you were going to skip. Uh, well, if I do a little bit of this, yeah. then uh, uh, listen. Believe me, some other parts you'll like better. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, handmade for democracy. Um, well, the, the 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 basic idea here is that. Modern democratic theory is, is committed to the idea that the source of knowledge of the good comes from an expression of individual interests. Um, modern democratic theory, the expression of individual interest, is taken as the primary source of knowledge of the good. doesn't come from philosophy. Uh, philosophy can't know anything about the good, but it's individuals, and we, we survey individuals through democracy. There are two interlocking arguments related to such a belief. Uh, ethically, since nothing is morally superior to the person in traditional liberal democratic theory, no one is more qualified to speak about persons' interests than those persons themselves. All citizens are presumed to have equal access to knowledge of the good precisely because it's their good that's ultimately at issue. Equality among free citizens is the necessary and perhaps sufficient condition for the manifestation of this knowledge. Epistemologically, as in science, the collective is further argued to be wiser than any individual. Collaborative knowledge production is superior to that of individual, insofar as collaboration can correct for individual biases. Uh, that's what I was arguing with regard to, that, that's the basic argument in the philosophy of science. That, uh, a challenge for democratic theory working within such a framework is to develop the most adequate versions of such arguments and to determine in detail their implications and applications under conditions of increasingly influ under conditions increasingly influenced by science and technology. Now, the major challenge within the community of political theorists to this view this theory of liberal democracy is a paper written by Philip Converse, published in 1964. Uh, according to Converse, the rationality of democratic voting behaviors is fundamentally in, at, 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 at issue. According to Converse, in empirical research on how people actually vote in democracies, only 10% of the public in a mass democracy those he terms ideologues, exercise voting choices rationally as some part of a belief system. That they actually, they, they, they have a worked out political belief system, a theory themselves, and then they vote in accord with that. They try to figure out, okay, which, which candidate reflects my, my theory best, and then vote for that candidate. The majority are non-ideologues whose votes reflect simply perceived self-interest. That's 42%. Now, just simply perceived self-interest is not a real uh, uh, just voting for what would benefit me is not necessarily going to produce a result that would be for the common good. Uh, in fact, lots of times competing self-interests allow some uh, demagogy interest to take control of the political realm. Uh, 